Sun Yat-sen undoubtedly was the central figure in the national movement of China. Uh, it was he who uh, played the major role in the revolution of 1911. And it was he and the party led by him, which was Tung Meng Hui, a revolutionary brotherhood, that could uh, bring about the end of Manchu rule. So it was in 1911 that Manchu rule came to an end and in its place was uh, formed the republican form of government in China. Sun Yat-sen formulated some major principles. He formulated the three principles of the people. And after the revolution, some years after the revolution, he uh, came up with his three major policies. Policies which were somewhat different from his three major principles in a sense, because the Manchu rule was no longer there. That made the major difference between the two uh, principles. Now, but uh, Sun Yat-sen and the movement led by him had suffered from certain limitations. As for example, Sun Yat-sen in the pre-1911 phase uh, did not make imperialism his main target of attack. Uh, in fact, he avoided uh, making attacks on foreign powers because uh, he felt that that might uh, uh, lead to the intervention by foreign powers, which would be detrimental to the revolution of 1911. That was one limitation. Uh, and the other point is that he could not uh, address the problems of the peasantry. He was concerned with urban problems and not with rural problems. That was his limitation. Now, and it was because of these limitations and other factors also that uh, the revolution 1911 was incomplete and imperialism, imperialist control remained in China. Uh, feudal system also remained intact. Uh, only the fact is that the Manchu rule was not there. That was the major difference. Now, uh, it was these limitations which were overcome later by the Communist Party of China under uh, Mao Zedong's leadership. And it was uh, Mao and the party that he led that ultimately carried forward uh, Sun Yat-sen's principles to some extent and ultimately could accomplish the new democratic revolution of 1949. Sun Yat-sen was born in 1866 in a peasant family uh, in village uh, Choi Hung, district uh, Siang Shan in the Guangdong province of China. And like all Chinese, he received his elementary education in a primary school. And then he was uh, taken to the Hawaii Island by his elder brother, where he enrolled himself in a missionary school where uh, English was the medium of instruction. And after uh, some years of study in Hawaii, he returned to his native village. But uh, by then, his horizons had been widened. And so uh, he found it very difficult to adjust himself to the uh, secluded, restricted village life. And so he, and uh, the need for further studies naturally uh, led him to shift to some other place. And it was in 1883 that he went to the British colony of Hong Kong. Hong Kong was the colony which uh, was uh, controlled by Britain af after the treaty of signing of the Treaty of Nanking uh, in 1842, we have pointed out earlier. And there he continued his education in English and in 1884, he uh, embraced Christianity. And he got himself admitted in a hospital, in a Canton hospital as a medical student, and he got a medical degree. From the 1890s, as we have pointed out earlier, demands had been raised from the side of the intellectuals, new intellectuals, new bourgeoisie, about reforms. Something must be done to bring about reforms. And uh, 
these ideas gain ground among the uh, Western educated people, among the commercial people, particularly living who had been living in the port cities, particularly in the port cities. And Sunir Sen, along with his associates, they also prepared some proposals, formulated some proposals uh, which for reform, which they uh, handed over to some of the important Manchu officials with the hope that uh, these would be uh, reciprocated positively. But uh, all these demands ended in failure. And uh, the failure of such attempts made Sunya Sen realize that uh, these would be of no avail and that uh, something different should be done and that uh, what was needed was to uh, bring about a revolutionary overthrow of the ex existing social order, existing Manchus particularly. Now, uh, Sunya Sen set up his revived China society, or Sing Chung Hui, and that was in 1894. It was set up in Honolulu. In fact, this organization was uh, China's first bourgeois revolutionary organization. And initially, it started with 20 members uh, with representations from different provinces. Meanwhile, China had been defeated in the hands of Japan in the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95. And the Treaty of Shimonoseki was signed, which was one of a long series of humiliating treaties that China was forced to chine, sign with the Western powers. And this Treaty of Shimonoseki was an was a flagrant interference in the internal affairs of China. Uh, it undermined China's suzerainty, uh, as of course was the case in the earlier treaties also. And so uh, people responded, there were uh, popular, there was popular discontent, and there were many outbreaks, uh, revolutionary outbreaks against the Manchu dynasty, against the Manchu rule. And revolutionary uprising was planned in Canton uh, by Sun Yat-sen himself, but that plan was exposed. And so uh, Sun Yat-sen became a fugitive uh, in China and a, a high price was declared on his head. Now, faced with such a situation, Sun Yat-sen left China and he went to Europe. He first went to England, he went to London. He went there in uh, 1895, and stayed there till July 1897. While he was in London, he studied in the uh, British Museum. It was there that he came to be acquainted with uh, the ideas, the writings of a large number of Western intellectuals, political scientists, philosophers, such as Karl Marx, Adam Smith, Spencer, uh, Mill, as also many others. The socialist movement uh, made a deep impression on his mind. And he not only studied, he also uh, visited uh, the slum areas. He was witness to many democratic movements that had been taking place in England. And he not only stayed in England, he also went to other European countries. And he note, he, uh, his observations he noted in his autobiography. What he felt is that, that uh, even though democracy, democratic form of government was established in Europe, in England and other, other countries, the people in Europe, in the countries of Europe, were not at all happy. Because there were many oppressed people also, the workers were there. And he was witness to the uh, plight of the working class who had been living in the slum areas during that period. And he felt that despite democracy, the people of Europe uh, had been thinking in terms of a revolutionary transformation in their own societies, in their own countries. New ideas began to take shape in Sunni Essence's mind. Uh, it has been pointed out by a scholar named Leo Sharman uh, in his book on Sunni Essence that uh, for Sun Yat-sen, uh, the ideas of democracy and socialism came together. Uh, in Europe, in the case of Europe, 
democracy, meaning capitalist democracy, capitalism emerged at a particular point of time. And after that, there was a gap of some centuries or many decades. And it was then that working class emerged. There was a time gap between uh, the idea of democracy taking shape in Europe and the idea of socialism taking shape in Europe. But Sonia Sen, for Sonia Sen, both these ideas came together. In early uh, in the early 20th century, Sonia Sen uh, had been in Japan, and so Sonia Sen, of course, was busy in Japan, uh, making propaganda among the among uh, some 10,000 overseas Chinese, and uh, convincing them of the need for a revolution uh, in China. Now, meanwhile, uh, within China, uh, many uh, important developments had been taking place, and China was faced with a uh, national crisis. Uh, foreign aggressiveness uh, was receiving no check, and uh, Sun Yat-sen felt that the humiliation of the court, Manchu court, definitely offered an opportunity for making revolution. He again planned an uprising, uh, in Huichao in 1900 and 1901, with forces mainly consisting of the Green Oats Group, Green Oats Armed Group, Secret Society, as also the Triad Society. But these movements also, these attempts at insurrections also failed. These were crushed by the Manchu uh, ruling clique. Now, then we have, then we have the, uh, another important uh, development. And that was the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. Now, and we know that uh, uh, Russia was defeated and Japan was victorious. Uh, the Chinese people uh, could never forget the humiliation that they had to suffer when they were defeated in the hands of Japan in 1894-95. But now that same small country, Japan, could score another big victory over a big European, this semi European country. Russia was compared to, it was associated with the European continent. If Japan could defeat such a big European country like Russia, then there was no humiliation in China which had suffered, suffering another humiliating defeat in the hands of Japan. So it removed the sting of China's own defeat suffered at the hands of Japan only 10 years before, only a decade before. And so uh, uh, Chinese people uh, started to think why uh, it became possible for Japan to score a victory over Russia. And they, uh, they felt that it was uh, it was a modernization that was the, uh, possibly the main reason. Uh, that was also the period when Protocol of 1901 was signed, just three or four years before that. And the Qing government, the Manchu government, uh, it had sold out the country uh, to the foreign powers. And in fact, all the nationalities of China, in fact, there are about 56 nationalities. Han is the dominant nationality, 9 fourth, 90, uh, 94th, uh, 94th uh, percent, uh, 94th, and the rest uh, belong to the other small nationalities. So all the nationalities, not just the Han, but all other small nationalities, Manchu was also another small nationality in China. Now, all of them wanted that the Manchu rule should come to an end. And there should be basic change in the situation, in the political situation. And since it was a new situation, the new situation demanded the formation of a new political party uh, for the bourgeois revolution, a new uh, democratic party, revolutionary party. And that revolutionary party was a revolutionary brotherhood or Tung Meng Hui. We have another scholar, Shifrin by name. Uh, he also wrote on Sun Yat-sen. Now, Shifrin points out that uh, Sun Yat-sen's main 
thesis was that all these anti-dynastic efforts should be unified. The revolution should not proceed in a way that it could invite foreign intervention. One has to do, one has to move in a way that could forestall foreign intervention. That was very important. So that they could not find any pretext for, a pretext for intervention. And uh, this Tung Meng Hui was, of course, formed in 1905, 30th July 1905, under the leadership, of course, of Sun Yat-sen. And this Tung Meng Hui adopted a program of revolution. And this program of revolution uh, consisted of eight documents, uh, including uh, the manifesto of the military government. That was one important document. And other was manifesto to the world. And it also adopted uh, policies for general administration, uh, foreign affairs, particularly armed uprisings in the various parts of the country. The, the main essence of Tung Meng Hui's political program uh, lay in one slogan. One is, uh, and that is to drive out the Manchus, restore Chinese rule, set up a republic, a republican form of government, and equalize land rights. These were the four basic principles on which the Tung Meng Hui program uh, was based. And it was from this slogan that uh, Sun Yat-sen developed his three principles of the people. Uh, one was people's nationalism, the second was people's democracy, and the other was people's livelihood. The most important uh, element in these three principles of the people was that uh, they wanted to free, it wanted to free the peasantry from feudal control, from feudal yoke. And it played an important role in the uh, in uh, assailing the feudal system. It could not do away with it, no doubt about it. But it raised the demand. The attack was against the feudal system. There is no doubt about it. Some historians also point out that his program also contained uh, elements of socialism. That is one view. But such a view has been contradicted by scholars uh, like uh, Israel Epstein. Uh, Israel Epstein points out that the socialist label put on it uh, is illusory, uh, simply because his program did not take into consideration the role of the working class. Without uh, taking into consideration the working class, you can never talk about socialism. And the second a uh, limitation was that it ignored the link between foreign imperialism and feudal reaction in China. The Manchu rule, the feudal reaction, it was very much tied up with foreign imperialism. Uh, that could not be identified. These were the two serious limitations. Now, the first principle, uh, as we have pointed out, was the principle of people's nationalism. And it aimed at the overthrow of Manchu rule and the establishment of the republican form of government. Sun so Yat-sen's uh, second principle was the principle of uh, people's democracy. Now, what Sun Yat-sen wanted to do was to establish a constitutional form of government, democratic constitutional form of government. And he wanted to bring about a political revolution as, as also a national revolution. Uh, political revolution, by political revolution he meant that uh, a democratic parliamentary system of government along the Western model was to be established. And when he talked about national revolution, it meant that there should be end of Manchu domination. These are the two things. The third principle was a uh, principle of people's uh, livelihood. And it reflected the social aspect of the program. And it referred to equal rights to land, uh, equalization of land rights. That was his, uh, that was uh, that uh, that was one important component of the Tung Meng Hui program. Uh, and it meant the nationalization of land. 
Now, uh, what Sunyasen probably had in mind was that uh, in the earlier period, the peasants had to pay their rent to the feudal lords. But after the nationalization of land, uh, probably that would be land would now be go to the tiller, uh, the peasants themselves. And that uh, they would have to, uh, they would be freed from feudal exploitation and the tax would be paid to the new state. No rent to the feudal lords and tax to the new state. So these were the three principles of the people, people's nationalism, uh, people's democracy and people's livelihood. Sir, why do you think that Sun Yat-sen did not concern himself with the problems of the peasantry? It was in the later period that he felt that the peasant problem should be addressed. But probably uh, he was a modern man and uh, he, his experience in the European countries, that was an urban experience, no doubt. Mm -hmm. So it, he was, uh, he, op he went to the slum areas, he observed the movements of the workers, democratic movements of the workers, and probably he did not have any experience of the peasant movements in the Western countries. Uh, so he felt that a parliamentary form of government, uh, end of Manchu rule, uh, that could be done uh, with urban people alone. Uh, I don't think that, uh, it, is, it is very difficult to say, but uh, he was concerned with urban problems. You can consider it to be his limitation. But later on, of course, he realized, his realization came later. It is not that if he, uh, at no point of time in his life, did he consider the present question to be an important question. But his realization came later. That could happen. Anytime. So, following on Hal Lance, I would like to ask you, is it really true that he didn't concern himself with the cause of the peasantry, but his principles like he, when he's talking about the equalization of land rights and nationalization of lands, don't they reflect some concern for the peasants? No, uh, he did not <coughs> make any organization among the peasantry, there is no mm. doubt about it. Uh, but. Uh, Despite the fact that he talked about equalization of land rights, uh, what followed from that concern is to, uh, is to extend his organizational network to the rural areas, to the countryside. But that he could not do. But, uh, probably uh, he was not very sure about how to address the peasant question. That must, definitely it must have been in his mind. But it was no clear cut concept only a vague idea. And since he talked about uh, anti-Manchu revolution, uh, uh, he was more concerned with that thing, with, uh, with uh, making propaganda among the military students, among the overseas Chinese, particularly for money, financial assistance, as also among the clerks, uh, urban, other urban people, etc. So he was, yes, that was there, but uh, uh, it was not, it could not be fully addressed, that we can see. <laughs>